This is our last lived it lecture for the season. It's hard to believe we're almost done. Um, and we're finishing off on a great note, much like we started. So I want to do a quick pulse check. Who here has heard of Hardline Solutions? Wow, great brand recognition. Well, uh, we are ecstatic this evening to have the founder of Hardline uh, Solutions, Walter Sigal Cow. Walter has an incredible knowledge of, uh, and experience in a number of skilled trades and has worked in various mining environments. Putting his talents to use, he built a radio remote control automation company, taking it from a six-person single office startup to a 60-plus person multinational operation that now exports industrial automation technology solutions to more than 30 countries. Hardline is a very successful global business that makes projects more efficient and enhances safety for workers. With applications in a range of sectors, Hardline's remote control machines and systems reduce human exposure to hazardous environments and alert workers to potential risks on work sites. Hardline designs, manufactures, sells, and maintains diverse systems that can be found in the mining sector, public works, and military operations, again, around the world. What sets him apart is that he is always identifying problems and finding solutions to build a better mousetrap, as he puts it. He has the vision, determination, and discipline to run a multinational business serving businesses around the world, staying ahead of his competitors by devoting one-third of his staff to research and product development. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very happy to finish off our Lived It, section, lived it Lecture sessions for the year. I'd like to introduce Walter Sigokow. Walter. Thank you, Don. Well, I guess we'll start at the beginning, as uh, we're really talking about business startups and some of the problems and uh, trials, and then, of course, the benefits and the, the good things out of it at the end. But one thing that uh, there's different reasons why people get into their own businesses, okay? And many, many times it has to be because they're trying to create a job for themselves. They've lost their job, something's happened, something's changed in their life, uh, maybe it's a move, disasters, whoever, whatever it is, but you have to, you just think, well, I'm going to create my own job, I'm really good at something. What happened with me was I started out in uh, 1981 working for Denison Mines in Elliott Lake as a mechanic underground. And after about three years, I ended up uh, taking a back injury and stayed working for a few more years, but it actually eventually uh, put me off work. So I ended up couldn't work in the mines anymore, but by this time I had already achieved my motor vehicle license, my heavy equipment license, and then later on I got my truck and coach license out of it. But now I have a bad back and I can't work in it anymore. So for anybody who's gone through the apprenticeship program and has started out their life in that form, that's an expensive way to do it. You make low pay, you gotta buy your tools, go to school, get laid off. You know, the end is about four or five years in with not a whole lot of money, unless you're fortunate enough to get on with one of the big players, the Valleys or the, uh, the, you know, the Glencores now, and you get on with one of those companies. But uh, so in about, uh, about 95, I ended up not being able to work underground anymore. So we have a great government here in Canada. It's a great country. So I got, ended up on what they used to call the cash for life system, which was workers' compensation. <laughs> and uh, they did testing and they said, we can't do anything for you. You need to get retrained. So in, in 89, I ended up getting a chance to go back to school, and I went to school here at Cambridge College for electronics engineering technology. And I think uh, quite a few people here probably know Tom. Tom was one of my teachers back in the day. Tom Fortin was one of my teachers back in those days. So that was a three-year program. Um, you know, the difference is, is I went back as a mature student. I was in my late 20s. And you get, you're going to school with guys who are just coming out of high school. They're 18 years old. I was pretty focused. I knew what I wanted out of it. I had my mechanics licenses. I wanted to learn electronics. And it was a really good program. But like any program, and this is what I tell people today, they ask me about going back to school. Any training program will only give you what you take out of it, what you put into it. If you want to go to school and show up half the time and, and put no work into it, well, you'll end up with, with nothing at the end of it. Lucky maybe to get a job at the end of it. But anyway, 
uh, after three years, I ended up with my electronics engineering technology uh, diploma from Cambrian College and a really good knowledge. And interestingly enough, learned that electronics engineering technologists typically got jobs uh, fixing photocopiers and printers and because Ontario Hydro had quit hiring people, they had, uh, they had enough people for their work, so there was no really good jobs in that. So unless you wanted to leave the north and travel, and not southern Ontario or anywhere else, I mean, you just had to get out of the country, there really wasn't that much money in electronics unless you did something yourself. My problem was I was good at some other things, so I ended up working out of electronics completely for about two years. And... Uh, started doing some construction work with some people and it got, that was, that's really not that good of a business because, you know, you just, good in the summertime, bad in the wintertime, people don't pay, they don't like paying for getting work done on their houses, so that didn't go so good. Then I was able to, there was a, there was a, a chance to get a job with a company that actually built radio remote control systems. And what they did was they bought a remote control system from one company, they bought PLCs from somebody else and they integrated this together and sold it to the end customer. So I got to work for this company, but it was quite interesting because the, the, the job placement, the job uh, uh, advertisement asked for electronics engineering technologists, mechanical aptitude would be a benefit and underground experience would be a real benefit. So when I went into the interview, I had my diploma, I had my licenses, plus I had five years underground experience. So it was kind of the holy grail of, of people to do this job. But you talk about starting a company and the hard parts about it and, the, and the, the good parts about it, yes, you work for yourself. And a lot of people say, oh, you're so lucky you get to work for yourself but it's actually you're pretty lucky to have a paycheck <laughs> a lot of the time. So, you know, you got the good and the bad of it. But this particular company didn't survive and they ended up going bankrupt. And around that time, we ended up with, uh, with six people got together with the idea of getting into this business to build radio remote control systems for the mining industry. And this is where the company's history kind of gets started. This was in... August 1st, 1996, this happened. And the six people had interesting backgrounds. There was myself, there was a salesman, there was a lawyer, um, an electronics engineer, a fellow I had trained in, in servicing these systems, two guys I had trained in servicing these systems were the six guys. And I was the one that didn't want to start this company. Okay. I argued with him, uh, he said, no, don't, you know, you, you think there's a lot of money in it, but there's a lot of costs and a lot of headaches can go with it. And I was, really wasn't interested. And that's where the beer enters a lot of <laughs> startups <laughs> because we were sitting out on, on uh, Wanapate and we were having a beer on a deck overlooking the lake. And I kind of got around to the point, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's an idea. And so when it got to that point, one thing I did ask the guys, I said, well, no, nobody had any money. Like typically, you know, there's, there's, two, there's kind of ways to start companies. One is you, you get guys together and they, you know, take a million bucks a piece or 100,000 a piece and they throw that in a pot and they go and rent an office and they get started and you get your, your salary out of this money you've invested. The problem is when you don't have any money to invest, you basically have to live on what you can possibly make, you know, week to week as you're trying to keep this thing going. That's the way we started the company. There was no money to put into it. So we just, you know, basically started up one day, had a couple of orders. Like there was, a, I knew some contacts that wanted some work done. So we had a couple of orders. And, uh, you know, that's the day we started was, uh, was August 1st, 96. And I asked the guys a question. I said, how long can you go without a paycheck? And I always remember this. Well, that'll never happen. Like, look, there's this contract and there's this going on. And, no, no, how long can you go without a paycheck? Because when the money runs out, there's nobody to go to. We have to, you know, just do without. That's all there is to it. I knew the answer myself. Okay? I was, didn't have any debt. In the, in the, I got a brother that's got pretty deep pockets, so I could go bug him if I had to for, you know, get you at least eat. So anyway, we started the company. 
And we started with a $250,000 contract with, uh, um, it was uh, Falconbridge at the time, in Min Gas Bay, Quebec, in uh, Gas Bay, Quebec. We did uh, four systems for them. And what we did is we bought a radio from one company, we bought a PLC from somebody else, we bought boxes and we assembled these things, and went out and installed them. And the, the real knowledge isn't just how, how to do the job. You have to understand the electrical and the hydraulics and how to put it in. So we did all that because we did not have our own radio system at that time. We just bought a bunch of parts. So that type of company is called a systems integrator. You're just integrating other people's parts and away you go. You're really not a manufacturer at that point. So we did those four systems with a quarter million dollars. Everybody pats themselves on the back. Look, this is great. Look at all the money we have coming in. And a month later, we sold another four systems to, to um, it was Battle Mountain Gold at the time up in Kirkham Lake. I did four systems for them. Again, all these, all these deals were because of contacts. These are people we knew in the field, you know, people I'd worked with, and uh, they knew I, I knew how to do the job. So that was another quarter million dollar contract. So here, two months in, we got a half a million dollars in sales. This is great. We're making all kinds of money. And February came along, and the bookkeeper says one day, she says, Walter, this is six months, mind you. This is February. Walter, is there any money coming in? So I don't know. Like, I'm designing stuff. I don't, I don't invoice. I said, well, what's on, what's on the books? She pulled it out, and there's no invoices. There's no receivables. Okay, well, what happens to the invoice? So I get the guys in. What, what work have you done? Oh, it's all invoiced. Okay, there's no receivables, and we have nothing to invoice. You've got six guys pulling paychecks out of a company. So what's in the bank? It wasn't enough to do payroll. <laughs> so, so we had a meeting. The six guys got together. We had a meeting. They're all sitting around. And, ah, it's, it's good, you know, we can go to the bank. and <laughs> We'll talk of banks are good, really good partners. But you've got to remember that you're a partner. They're not a charity. <laughs> okay? so we'll go to the bank and we'll, we'll, board, you know, we'll extend our line of credit. Okay. We started the company, I said, we will never borrow money to pay a paycheck. That's never going to happen. Okay? You gotta, don't, if you don't have money, you don't get a paycheck. So then we sat around and they finally come to me and they said, what are we going to do, Walter? I said, well, we don't get a paycheck this week, do we? And two of the guys said, well, I can't live without a paycheck. So two guys left the company <laughs> at that point. So attrition works on that part too. <laughs> so it was basically because, you know, this is the concept when you get into business, you want to go into business, okay? Usually it's because you're, you're, you really believe in something, but you also, you, you got to put your heart and soul into it. Now, one of the fellows who left the company, no sooner did we start, started renovating his house. Well, that's a problem, okay? This is time. If you're going to start your own business, you got to put your time into it, okay? So how's he going to put time into it while he's renovating his house at the same time? You know, and what about the money? What about the part where you got to eat <laughs> later on? You know. So anyway, the two fellows left the company at that point, and that was in uh, '97. Now, I get the time goes by, you get the dates mixed up a bit. But some of the fun parts about being in business too is I think it was in January '97. I had the opportunity. I was invited to go to Chile for the first time to do a presentation with, uh, with one of our customers to Cadelco on a big project. It was a huge project. And first time I'd ever been to South America, I'd never been on holidays, had never been down the Caribbean or anything else like this. First time I went to Chile, you know, no hablo espanol, <laughs> I think. So I get off a plane, it's all great, and head down the highway, you get into the, the meeting, and you sit there, and they get my, talking gibberish because they don't understand a word they're saying and they turn around and say, well, what about this piece? You even know if that's what the question was. You're just trusting people to, to talk. So anyway, we went and did these meetings. It was a great time, nice trip and stuff. I remember the, I remember the, uh, they dropped me off the hotel at night and I was hungry and they don't eat until late, like 10, 9, 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> they dropped me off the hotel. I go up to the room. I turn the TV on, click, 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 click. You don't understand anything on that TV. So remember, this is in 97. This is not the way it is today. So I went back downstairs and I started heading out the door and the girls working at the, ho at the ho hotel. Like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't go. And we were downtown Santiago, which was pretty, 
<laughs> pretty wild in those days. So I walk outside. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. And I can't understand. They're yapping away at me there. And I walk outside. And the windows, there's no windows. They roll the steel down over the windows. The streets are rolled right up, and it's huge. Swear the tumbleweeds were flowing up that street. There was nothing going on. Okay? I just kind of walked about a block, and I looked around, and I walked back to the hotel, went back inside, and you saw them all, they got all happy because I made it back alive or something. I don't know. But yeah, and then I waited around for them to come and pick me up so I go get something to eat. <laughs> you know? But that, it was, those are good times because you, you had a first chance to travel. So when I came back to Canada, this was before the, the, this meeting we had with the six partners, the sales guy at the time. He had this big plan going how he was going to go down to Chile and he was going to start generating sales in Chile. And this is what he was talking about, Tom. I'm planning this trip to Chile. I came back from Chile and I sat with him. His name was Joe. I said, Joe, I says, how the heck did you expect you were going to go sell something in Chile? He says, well, I was going to go down, get a hotel room, pick up the phone book and start flipping through the phone book and start phoning people. <laughs> Don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and at that day, you would, you would be hard put to get somebody on an, on a, at a company that spoke English back 15 years ago. It was pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. That was his business plan. That was his sales plan for this one here. That was a pretty interesting one. So, by the way, he was one that left <laughs> a month later. <laughs> so, the, it, that came down to the four of us. So, this was uh, 90, uh, 97. We went eight months without a paycheck. So I borrowed a bit of money from my dad and my brother and a little bit here and there. Yeah. Sold my truck, sold my trailer, sold my skidoo. <laughs> you know. So you gotta be willing to put your heart and soul behind it if you're gonna if you're gonna actually go out and do it right, eh? So I sold the toys, didn't have any time to play with them anyway. I was working all the time. So <laughs> so the the reason what we were doing at that time is we were actually designing our own radio system, okay? Because the reason I remember back, flashing back to my past employer, I remember sitting in the, in the office with, uh, there was a young graduate engineer fellow that ran the engineering department, myself, the sales manager and the, and the owner, and I told him, I said, if you don't fix this radio you're using, if you don't get something better than this, this company's gonna bankrupt you. It was just bad. Okay, they couldn't maintain it. Anytime you sent it for repair, it was two months. It was just nasty. So we were designing our own system, and we we actually finished that design. We got more service work and stuff, so it was able to start. It was only four of us left now, so the paychecks were a little a little easier to take. But we actually got that radio built in the in the beginning of ninety eight. We actually built our first system. And, you know, with good contacts in the field, we actually installed it at uh, Placer Dome's mine in Timmins. Uh, that was when it was uh, before they did the open pit at the, at the dome mine. And we put it underground there against a competitor, and it actually had really good results. But we kept building on it and redesigning it, and by, by about Eight or ten months later, we put out version two of the system, which was uh, is extremely close to what we sell today. There's been chips changing, and you know, there's all sorts of stuff that's changed like that. But the physical system is almost identical today as it was at that point in time, and it's always made it upgrade upgradable, so you could just change a board, but you use the same boxes and stuff like that. That was in '98. The this is where things change when you, in business, from a service-oriented business to a manufacturing-style business. That's a fundamental difference. In a service-oriented business, if you're by yourself or one or two people, the most money you can make is what you can physically work by the hour. It's just, it's just a financial uh, concept. When you manufacture, if you manufacture something and, and you hit the, the, the product, and you find people come in and say, well, you know, I, I need a thousand of those. Well, it definitely doesn't cost you as much to build a thousand as it does to build one. That's where you actually start making money, is when you manufacture something. Now, when I say manufacture, that could be a piece of software, it could be electronic board, it could be a, it could be a cup, you know, something that you physically build and you can mass produce, okay? 
um, you know, not, I mean, not saying that opening a gas station, not, not a gas station anymore, but opening a garage would be a mistake. It creates a decent job sometimes if you're a good mechanic and you've got a business head, you can make a decent living. But it's not, you'll never ever get to the point of when you're as a manufacturer where you have sort of unlimited ability to make, make a profit at that time because it just depends how much you can sell. Now, get off, track, off topic a little bit there. So, late 90s are going forward. We started manufacturing in 98. Uh, it was a very good system compared, uh, compared to our competitors. Very important points. You can build a phenomenal product, the best mousetrap out there. But if it's more expensive than your competitor, you will lose sales because some people will buy the cheapest product they can find. Okay? And anybody who's interested in going into a lot of the South American markets, be prepared for that one. It's a very, very hard uh, uh, sales pitch to try and sell a more expensive item than the competitor selling. You need to be cost competitive. Okay? Um, the, the quality of the product in, in mature markets, Canada, you know, the Australia, different markets like that, a good quality product, they'll pay a premium for. Okay? A winning combination is a, is a superior product at a competitive price. Then it's a win-win situation. That's what we ended up with. Because what we did was we became the manufacturer of the major component of the system. Okay? We weren't buying from somebody else and, and them making the manufacturer's margins. We became the manufacturer. So we took out the middleman. We, be, we, we are the middleman now. There's nobody between us uh, and, and the end client. Okay? So as you start building more parts, your cost starts dropping and then you gotta look at your labor and things like that. But that's where you can start increasing your, your, uh, your profit margins. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, that's why you go in business. You know, that's, why, that's one question everybody has to ask themselves if they're going to go in business. Okay? Why am I going into business? Well, I love doing this. Okay, that's one thing. Can I make money doing it? Because <laughs> if you can't make money, you're, you're not going to eat. So that's a fundamental concept people have to look at is you've got to make money. You know? So at the, and after a while, you've got to make more money. Start hiring people and then you're going to make more. And, you know, if you want to buy a building at some point, then you've got to make more money to pay for that. And it just, that's the way the, the world works. So late 90s, we're doing pretty good. Um, company's profitable, was profitable in the first year. Uh, very important concepts in, in, uh, in, this, in the business I got into. It is fully, uh, um, I'm looking for a word here. It fits into the SRD credit system. Scientific Research and Experimental Development Tax Credit. Okay? It's a phenomenal system for startups. It works really well until you make a half a million in profit, and then it doesn't work so well after that. But wh what it is, and you do not need to hire an accounting firm to actually do the claim for you. You can, you can do it yourself. You just look at what you're doing. You say, okay, am I, I'm doing an experiment here. That receipt, take a photocopy, put it in a binder. That's part of the experiment. That's what you're doing. You're creating your file for the, for the claim at the end. And what happens is, and here's, here's an evil part of the whole scenario also. Labor is fully acceptable. That's the best part of it because the government knows we live in a lo lovely country here and we pay lots and lots of taxes and they know if we make, pay wages, you're going to pay taxes. So they have no problem doing the SRND credit on taxes, on, on wages. What ends up happening if you, if you pay a salary of $50,000 to somebody, and the only thing they do is work in a, in a research, not a research, it's a product development type of project, okay? At the end of the year, you file a claim. I believe they dropped it to 1.6 now. It used to be 1.65. There's an overhead cost to that. You add, uh, multiply it by 1.5, 1.6 now, I think it is, which means that that, I'm going to go to $100,000 so I get an even number. It becomes $160,000. On your tax form, it gives you $160,000 of expenses. And in, in this, in this, not 100, sorry, that was wrong. For the tax, for this tax credit. 
you get back about 30% of that in a tax credit. Okay? If you're not making money, they'll actually return, give you a tax refund. So you can actually get money back on that. Okay? Typically what happens though, is an entrepreneur, he's so busy and, or she's so busy thinking about the project they're building and building their business that they don't do the paperwork and follow the paperwork to build their SR and ED credit. So an accounting firm comes along or somebody comes along and says, well, we'll do that for you for a percentage of the claim. And those percentages can get quite high, 25, 30% easy if you, if you haven't done any work yourself. So you say, well, that's great because this is, and they tell you this is free money, which it is really, it's free money. So you, they do the claim and you get this, this tax refund. But the next year, if they, if they give you back $100,000, that $100,000 is taxable the next year. So it's actually, it's good for cash flow, but you got to remember that it's income the next year. So you're actually not getting back 30%. You're getting back a lot less than that. So you got to be very careful how you do it. But done properly, it's, it's a very valuable tool. One of the, and Canada is one of the few countries that has a decent system like that. And it does work very well. When you reach a half a million in profit, that all changes because, because they drop that to half. You don't no longer get 30%. You get a lot, lot less than that. So it changes completely. Um, but it is a very good pro, uh, program for anybody who's doing something where they're trying to develop a new product. It's a must, you'd be, put it this way, you'd be a freaking idiot not to <laughs> take advantage of it, okay? So we were doing these SR and ED credits and, and through the years, so that helps as you get flowing because it, it helps cash flow. It kind of pushes it to the next year and helps you with your cash flow. In, in, two, in uh, the, the you then go back, you gotta do a business plan. You're gonna start a business, you need to do a business plan. And this is, where, this is where I'll talk about one of the partners you're gonna have in business from the day you start until the day you finish that business is one of the partners that you're cursed with and you're gonna deal with for the rest of your life is Revenue Canada and the Canadian government. You'll pay them for permits and everything else and just get ready for that one. The second one is, which is a partner, what you need is your banker. The banks, people have to understand, if you're going in business to make money, your bank's going in business to make money. So if you're going to go to your bank and you're going to pitch a deal to your bank, you know, you want them to help you get in bed with you here and finance your company, you better give them a plan that shows how you're going to repay the money they lend you with the interest. Because the bank's in business of lending money to make interest. They're not in the business to give money away for entrepreneurs to lose. <laughs> okay? And realistically, uh, I don't know the statistic right offhand today, but I mean, statistically, it used to be in the order of 90% of businesses, new businesses, would close in the first year. And then out of the remaining, you know, 50 or 70% of those would close within three years. And not all of them would go under. Some just get working and say, well, this is not what I thought it was, and I'm going to, not what I want to do. Okay? So one of the issues in a startup company, unless you have assets yourself, which means you, you could own your own house. So if it was an older person, they own their house, or a younger person who had a, you know, inherited a house or had something good in bricks and mortar that they can, they can use as collateral for the bank, you don't have anything, okay? Because the company doesn't even have a year's worth of books to show the, the bank that you can make money. That's what it's all about. How do, you, how do you prove you make money? So there's some magic numbers there. One of them, that's three years. So you need financial statements for three years if you want to go in and talk to a bank. Because otherwise, who the heck are you? you, you can you even manage your finances? You know, do you know what a, how to balance a checkbook at the end of the month? So in our business plan, we plan to go for three years. There were six guys, mind you. And it was planned after, after three years, we'd do our year end, and we'd all sit down and have a beer, just like we started the company, and say, okay, is this what you thought it was going to be? You know, are you having fun? Are you in or are you out? Because at three years, we're gonna buy a building. That was in the plan, we're going to buy property. Because that's what, the, that's what you call bricks and mortar. And if you're gonna really grow a business for long term, you have to have assets. And property is one of the assets that just doesn't depreciate. You buy it, it'll keep growing in value and growing in value and that's how you, you know, when you finally really need some serious money, you better own property because otherwise, the bank's not going to play with you on this, okay? So that was in our plan, buy a building. So we ended, up, we ended up looking all over town, and the property came for sale, 
and it was the, anybody who's from the, uh, the uh, Dowling Ender goes through, it was the old community center in Dowling. It came up for sale. And it had been sold in 1995 or 96, it sold for about $70,000 when they rebuilt uh, the, the there used to be a skating rink and the kids lit it on fire and burnt it out and then they refed it as the new community center and their old building became redundant and they sold it. The guy who bought it, he had a contract went south on him, there was a mining contractor and, and he ended up losing the building. And that was about 98, the building uh, ended up going back to the bank. Now, for anybody who's, who's familiar with the housing market or property market in Sudbury and going through the 80s, the 90s, and the like 2000, up to 2002 or something like that. Okay, it was bank owned houses and buildings and properties everywhere. There was no problem finding a, a repoed house in, the, in this city. Okay, not the way it is today so much, but that's the way it was then. So this, this building went back to the bank in 98 and stayed empty for two years. And when we found it, I was uh, sitting at lunch, uh, looking through a magazine, and I'm looking for properties. and. It was listed for $114,000. I know that building, like I hadn't been in it, but I drive by this, that's a big building, you know? So I took the magazine, I sat aside, and I took the next week's copy of the magazine. Same building, 95,000. So, so this was on a Sunday. Now I'm gonna re repeat that, this was on a Sunday, I'm in the office working, <laughs> okay? So I got my, uh, my son was working with me, he was a lot younger at the time. And one of my partners, he I called him, I said, we got to go out and look at this building. So we went out, this was in, around Christmas time. So we went out and we had a look at it and we crawled through the snow banks and looked in the windows and stuff. Said, yeah, this is 95,000 bucks. We had 120,000 set aside to do this job. 120,000 wouldn't, wouldn't pay the development fees today. <laughs> we, had, we had that set aside to do this, this project. So we looked and said, we got to look inside. So we real estate agent went in the next morning Monday morning, walked through the place and said, we could move in here and do nothing. Open the door, put our gear on the floor, move the desks in we had. You gotta remember, we were in an office at this time that was about, probably from that line right there, this area here. To get between desks, you had to get up out of the chair, move, put the chair in, this guy was set aside, this one was squeezed by, it was piled high, it was, <laughs> I think we were breaking some serious fire codes on that <laughs> habitation of that, that office. And uh, we look in here, we said, well, we could go in here and everybody could have their own room and never talk, you could not talk to anybody all day and we'd have lots of room. But as a case happened was, you know, your partners are shareholders, which are your partners. You basically get married. A lot of people don't think about that, you know. And marriages, a lot of time today, they're not so good, they end up in divorce. Because you got, first you got six people. Two of them didn't think they could go without a paycheck, so they left the company. At this point in time, there were four of us, and two of the guys didn't want to commit to buying the building, okay? So we were a cash company, everything was paid for, we didn't owe any money, and they didn't want to take the step of getting in debt. That was a step they didn't want to take. And so it ended up happening that in 2000, the other two partners left the company, and the two of us went on our own and we bought the building and, and carried on at that point in time. That was in uh, February 1st, 2000. It was a semi-amicable separation. Yeah. Still didn't have all that much money, but had some, at least had some money on the books. So anyway, we were able to do that. Now, interestingly enough, it, the, prob the thing was is uh, the, the one fellow who left was the one that had kind of the financial backing. So when he left, the company all of a sudden really didn't have any financial backing. The banker was the guy's friend. The insurance agent was the guy's friend. The accounting firm was the guy's friend, okay? So now I'm sitting, we, we were sitting with no accountant, no lawyer, no, you know, no bank really, because uh, something happened that screwed the banking up. So what I did was there was a contact uh, that I'd met over the years, and he was, he came up through the, through the, 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 the banking system, he worked for the BDC, he worked for Case Populaire. We hired him to come in and actually present the company to a bank. 
and he was a smart guy, financial guy. He said, well, for 6,000 bucks cash up front, I'll present, <laughs> I'll build that for you. So he actually took our books and he went through everything, he analyzed it, and he made arrangements with, uh, to meet the, the bankers at the time and we present the company. And it was a different way of doing business because realizing your, your, your banker is your partner, your bank's your partner, you also have to realize that your, your bank wants you as a customer if they believe you can pay, okay? You're their partner. So that's why you have to be very prepared if it, when the time comes that you need, to, you need to approach your bank is you've got to go in with a proper business plan, with a proposal, with your numbers crunched, and you've got to stand there and say, you know, this is a business plan. We can make money with this. If you wait until the day you walk in and say, you know what, I'm flat broke and I need a loan, <laughs> you ain't going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh no, sorry, it won't be like that. It'll be, do you have somebody who can co-sign for you? Which is collateral. Or if you've got your house you want to sign on or do something else. It just has to do with putting some, some bricks and mortar behind the, the company. So this was in 2000. So at, in 2000, there was two partners left. You remember the company was profitable every year, but, you know, profitable, you can make $10,000 and you're profitable. And we paid salaries. We're, paying, we're, we're actually taking a salary out of the company all the time. So anyway, we, uh, we carried on from there. In the meantime, I had a chance to go to South America again. We did a lot of good service work. And one of the things that happened was we did a project on Baffin Island for, uh, the company's been changed a few times. It was called uh, Breakwater Resources, one of the mining companies. And they had a special application they wanted to do. And they, what they were doing was there was an old mine and they were just recovering the pillars. Like a lot of mining people here, they, they were t recovering pillars. So they were taking pillars that were required to hold the mine up and they were shaving the sides off them and backing out of the mine. So remote controls, well, that's what we do. So the thing was is, is they, they bought a system from a competitor and they couldn't get it to work as it was on a Caterpillar front end loader, not a scoop tram. And they're kind of a weird machine, so they couldn't get this thing to work. And they paid them for three service trips to go up, and they couldn't get it working, couldn't get it working. And this was a situation where innovation, many times, is driven by necessity. They had to have this work, or they couldn't mine that mine. So we ran into them, actually, at a trade show, and said, I guarantee I can get it working for you. And what we'll do is, is we'll install it, and when it's working and it's actually making you money, we'll give you an invoice. But you pay us right away. Not no such thing as 90 days or 60 days to get paid. Like, we won't charge you anything up front. When that thing's making you money, pay us. Okay? And we did. We got it working and, and we got paid for it. And then I got a phone call from one of their other mines, which happened to be in Honduras, and a second mine that's in southern Chile. And they were having the same problems. So we, when we started exporting, we actually got dragged out to export. We didn't go to trade shows and, and you know, develop this business or market or advertising or anything else. We just got called from the service we did, and they took us out. And I don't know if that was my first trip to Honduras, and then I went to Nicaragua after that. Southern Chile installed systems in all those countries. I still didn't speak very much Spanish, but started learning it at that time. But uh, that's how our company got started doing international work. And... By this time, the system was a standard system, so the profit margins were, were considerably better on them. And every time they do a system, it'd never be one, it would be three, four, five systems. So you actually, the profitability got pretty good on it. That's how we got started international. Then we ended up, meet, you meet people and you start building contacts. And that's what build, business is about, is you start building contacts and relationships. And then you end up selling another system here, another system there, and then we end up getting all over the world. So with that first opportunity, um, we do all the remote controls in Honduras. Used to, just lost that customer to a competitor. Who used to be a customer. Because <laughs> I got a lousy sales department. <laughs> used to anyway. <laughs> didn't have a sales department. Um, I said that out loud, didn't I? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, Nicaragua's been a good, good customer. And then... Over the years, what happened, we've put about 120 systems into Peru now. 
and all the different different mines and everywhere else. So we own an office in Peru. I opened that about five years ago. And if in the future when people get to the point you start exporting, okay, you probably will not look at opening an office in a foreign country. You'll probably end up working with a dealer. Be very careful with how much information you give a dealer, how much information you give somebody who's not physically attached to you. Number one, good luck suing somebody in a foreign country. You guys will kiss that one off and not even bother trying because that's just not going to happen. Unless you're Microsoft or something, then you might go do something. So be prepared to lose if you're in that foreign country on that part. But uh, what I did was I gave, I taught my dealer in Peru how I built the company here. And I taught him how to, how to service competitors' equipment and how to do deals and everything else. And in uh, 98, he took us for about $150,000 cash, another about $100,000 worth of parts we had in stock, and told me to go screw myself. <laughs> so a quarter million dollars shot in one, in one shot. So what we did is we opened our office in Peru in 98. Everybody remember 98, fall of 98 and beginning of 99 when the economy collapsed and First Nickel closed and FNX closed and Pextrata sent everybody home. I'm spending money opening an office in Peru. <laughs> so that was, it was uh, probably analyzed out. That probably wasn't the, the most brilliant thing to do. But we had no choice. You have the customers, the services there. And if you want to keep the business, you, you either you do what you need to do. And I had no, there was no way to find another distributor at the time. That was one of the big issues. So, <clears throat> the, that, that's not, so we went into Chile, we owned an office there. And then last April, we actually opened an office in Santiago, Chile, because we do a lot of business in Santiago, Chile. But because of what I learned in Peru, what I was able to do was hire a really good general manager right off the bat for Chile. And, uh, we, it's funny how things go full circle. I don't know if I finished the story about, uh, about doing the presentations at Chile in, in, uh, in 97. We didn't get that order. 98, I did more presentations, didn't get that order. And we got a few small ones over the years, but uh, right now we're, we have guys working in, uh, in Chuki Canada in Chile doing a, a nice, nice big, really big project, very lucrative one. <laughs> so. And it stays summer there all the time. So sent them down there for the winter. Um, we got time for questions after? Yeah, we got two minutes. Okay. Okay. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that, that you really, people have to analyze. One of the things is we get in business because we want to, sometimes just want to create a job for yourself or we have a passion, that's something we're passionate about, we want to build it. Okay. At the end of the day, remember, we got to make money. That's number one. You got to make a living out of, out of, out of whatever we get into. Okay. Then you got to really start studying how to hold on to your money. It's not so hard to make money, but you got to hold on to some of it at the end of the day. And you got to really think about where you believe you can go. Because if your income is $100,000 a year, you kind of spend $100,000 a year. If your income is $500,000 a year, you start spending $500,000 a year. And then you got to plan for the future because what, what you need to have coming in in the future to maintain that lifestyle can be a lot different than what you think it's going to be. But some of the stuff that they'll talk about is uh, a lot of accounting things to do. Uh, crystallization, I'm going through this right now. Some stuff is not such a good idea. It really, really needs to get analyzed. You know, so you can make proper planning for the future. When you start out and you think, boy, I'd like to make $100,000 this year. Well, that's kind of not that hard to make, <laughs> you know. They say, "Oh, I want to do five hundred thousand this year," and that's not that hard to do. And then you next thing you do, well, five million dollars, and that's not a whole lot of money to make, you know. So eventually, what happens is is you you, you get profitable, and things that sounded like a really really good idea when your target was a half a million dollars are not such a good idea when it's when it's five million dollars. Okay, so there's just a, some serious planning, and. You've got to ask the question about what do I plan on doing in the future? Am I building a business up to sell it? If that's what the target is to get a, like back in, in the late 90s, there was the dot-com era. 
you know, get a little piece of software, bing, 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 and sell a company for bazillions of dollars, you know. And that kind of burst and, and uh, didn't work out so good. But there are companies today that can be started, built up, and then sold. So is the, is the product the company? If that's the case, your planning, your financial planning for the future is a heck of a lot different than it is if you plan on going through the company. You've got to look at succession planning. You've got to look at it real early, especially for especially when it comes to passing a company on to children. Uh, statistically, really, really bad idea. A lot of them don't make the second generation and very, very few make the third generation to go to a child. And there's books and there's things written on it. All the statistics are there. Uh, a child that works in the company right through and grows up with it and has you know, 30 years of experience and then passes on is one thing. But better make darn sure you're, you're Will and everything deals with that because if he's got siblings and they've never worked in the company and all of a sudden they walk in and say, well, I'm a third of this company. There's three of them. Well, yeah, that's going to go over real well. <laughs> You're getting divorced in a hurry. Worst, worst lawsuits in Canada are families and businesses. When businesses, usually from a death, end up in the courts, some of them are disasters. Like millions and millions of dollars just, just peed away with, the, with lawyers and so on trying to fight over you know, who's, who gets the, the big yacht or whatever, you know? So, okay, anyway, that's enough for this one here. <laughs> well, number two cost me $1.7 million to get rid of. <laughs> so, but, but it actually worked out. Um, sounds like a lot of money. Actually, it's not that much money when it comes down to it. If I could write a book on how to screw your partner out of a company, he did it for me. <laughs> because what happened was, is, is uh, when I started the company, my son was 14 years old. And at 14 years old, you're not going to make him an owner in a company. Okay? But he worked with us for 14 years old. He's 31 years old now. When I had to buy my partner out, I did not buy him out myself. I financed my son to buy him out. Okay. So what happened was, is my son now owns that part of the company. I actually made a little boo-boo on that one, was I financed him to buy 25%, and, well, more than that, 28%, I believe it was, and three key guys that I thought were key guys to take the other, 20, the other 7% each. So it was 7, 7, 7, 28, and, and my 50. So he owns that part of the company, when it's an arm's length transaction, so somebody who's not related to you and they buy shares, the CRA has no uh, ability to question the value of that sale. Okay, so the price he paid for that was the price he paid for it. I croak, he has to take the company over, it's a mandatory valuation, and with the, whoever the evaluator in comes in and says, well, we're going to look at this, look at your annual sales, look at all this stuff. Oh, there's goodwill there. Goodwill is if you sell, <laughs> you know, sell product for the next several years. So it ends up working out very well. Now, I will mention that was not an amicable separation. Okay? Uh, my partner was, this is, this is pretty fundamental. Some people can make money and they can live with it and some can't. Some people can travel, not get in trouble. Some people can't, okay? When you go to other parts of the world, things that are not acceptable here are not frowned on, are legal, okay? So, but you can't come back to Canada and do those things. <laughs> so this is where the issue came up. So that separation went pretty, you know, went badly, but went very quick. I knew, I knew a number that he was looking for. It was one with the six zeros. I knew that was his number, and I just put the number in front of him, and he, he walked away. Okay. So that's where you need your bank. So I'll go back <laughs> to your bank. Because I did not have a million dollars. I borrowed it from my bank. Okay. And it's because we owned our building. It was paid for. We owned the equipment in the building. It was paid for. We had receivables coming in. It was a, it was a viable business. And my bank lent me... Think about this, a million dollars, wasn't quite a million dollars, about $800,000, to buy nothing. 
You gotta remember that, I'm buying nothing. I'm giving that to somebody. We're not bringing an asset into the company. We're doing nothing, it's just gone, eh? And, my, and the bank financed. Paid that off in three years, okay? And it's not 800,000. When I say it was a million dollars, after tax dollars. When you start talking a million dollars, that's 1.6, 1.7 million, 1.8 million in after tax dollars you have to make. Because Revenue Canada requires their chunk off the top, which is lots of money, okay? Now, I mentioned there was, there was four guys. I bought out number two and number three already. <laughs> so I'm already down to, to uh, well, they, they did their part though. Those, one guy did not. One guy didn't do his part. But the other guy, he, he, was, he was critical to the company. It came up through. He still works for us. He's an employee of the company. He just walked out in one day and said, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like the pressure, the, the mental pressure of being a, a shareholder. And he asked us to buy him out. And that was, uh, was, good, was a good payout. First off, what you'll try and do is you'll go to a trade show because you've got to try and get into a foreign country and find a, a distributor. Use the internet. Put your stuff out on the internet. If you've got something you can YouTube, get the YouTube out there. Get, get the, you know, if it goes viral or something, you'll, you'll do really good with it. But get it out there where people can contact you. Don't send a flipping thing to anybody that ain't paid for. Okay, there's scammers out there. There's a bazillion people out there trying to get money f without any return on it, okay? If you get out to a trade show, you're going to get all sorts of people show up. If you're in the mining industry, I mean, so many companies in, in, in this area are, are doing something that they're going to try and sell to a mining industry. You're going to go to a trade show and these people are going to show up and I, I, I know this guy at this mine. You know, okay, the guy's a janitor. You know, everybody knows somebody, right? So if he puts you in a meeting and he puts you up with the right people, okay, that's one thing, you know. So, and be careful what you sign for a deal, dealer, or for a contract. Okay, I'm gonna confuse this one here, so don't take this to the bank when you leave. A, distribu a distribution agreement is different than a dealer agreement. It's different than all these different contracts. And the rights can be nasty. The rights can be to the point where you couldn't sell with the right contract. You couldn't sell your own product in their country after. They'll sue you, and successfully, because you're on their turf now. So you really, really got to do your homework. Little things, your mark, okay? You take that down to Peru, some guy can walk in and try and register that mark. If, you, if he gets that, gets that mark registered, I'll pay him to use my own mark from here, okay? I went through that, because when the guy went south on me, I had to actually go after him, and we were just lucky enough okay, to get him, it, he was already applied for it, and there's a 30 day or 60 day waiting period. And we had to fight for it and prove that it was our mark. Well, it was kind of, it was a little bit easy because I had pictures of him with the logo on his shirt and my booth in the Canadian <laughs> section. So it was kind of easy to prove. But you had to, to choose a guy, okay? They gotta sell. That's the only thing they bring to you is sales. So make sure they can sell. So a lot of them will want, they wanna sign you up right away. No, 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 no. Okay, you, you, you think you can sell this? Let's go out and sell something, you know? We'll give you three months or something. Start signing 10 year contracts, you're screwed. Like you'll, you'll never get out of it because you gotta sue them in their country, okay? Something else to remember, when you deal in foreign countries, all contracts have to be in their language. So here in Canada, you write a contract, you say, this contract will be interpreted, interpreted in English. If you're in Quebec, this contract will be interpreted in French. You're down there, that contract's interpreted in Spanish, okay? Spanish, it's like saying French in France and Quebec is the same thing and Chemi French is the same, is the same thing. They're different. You go to Mexico, words are different. Peru, the words are different. Chile, the words are different. They'll use different words for the same stinking thing. It's, it's, you, gotta, you gotta really know your contract in that area. So in Chile, for instance, our lawyer in Chile is a Chilean that grew up in Canada, in BC, and went, did his, his uh, studied in Canada, became a lawyer in Canada, and was sent down by his firm to Chile to work with a Chilean firm. 
met his wife and lives in Chile now. <laughs> so that happens all the time. So, so if you go out of the country, you're better if you're single. <laughs> if you're going to work for long periods of time, bad divorce rates for the guys who go out of the country and then don't, uh, don't think that one out too much. But yeah, so our lawyer there, the guy's fully bilingual English, understand the English companies, understands the Chilean uh, tax laws. Because you start a company, start it two different ways, it means two different things. How you can get your money out of the country after, how you can, uh, you know, as a, as if selling, you could easily sell to a mining company in Mexico, and if they buy direct from you, you go F will be your doc, They'll arrange for shipping, the guy will come in, they'll inspect the stuff, you know, and you may get your, your payment right there, it depends on your documents. But eventually, if you're going to sell something that requires service, that's the best products, by the way. The best, best product is something that breaks. <laughs> Give it to a miner. <laughs> They're great, they'll bust it all to pieces. So if it requires service, you have to be prepared to service it. So if you're in those countries, you've got to look for a guy who can service your stuff. You know, that's a difficult question.